Hello, and welcome back to The Hatch. I'm Sammy Roth. And I'm Rosie Murphy, and this is the podcast where we talk about Lost. We've got Season 5, Episode 8 for you. It's La Fleur. It is one of our favorites. I'm sure it's one of yours, too. And on that note, we have the man who directed this episode, Mark Goldman. You may remember him from Season 2 when he spoke about being an editor on the show. We'll get to Mark. Uh, First, we've got some discussion of the episode. Let's get right into it. We start every episode of The Hatch, as I'm sure you know by now, with our hot takes about the week's episode. Uh, Rosie, why don't you get us started here? What's your hot take about Lafleur? When Sawyer decides to confront Richard on the bench in the dark, holy shit. I mean, I thought Sawyer was going to be way undermatched. I know he's a con man, but can you really <laughs> con Richard? And Sawyer goes out and really goes toe-to-toe with him, and it's not by conning him at all. He tells him the truth, you know? He said, where did you bury that bomb is not a lie. Um, or did you bury that bomb, I guess, not where did you bury it. But he's he's drawing on knowledge that he actually has, and it ends up being, you know, not not Sawyer the con man at all. It's Sawyer a really, really skilled and kind of fearless negotiator. It's impressive. No, I, I agree with you completely. And I not only I think was it so impressive that Sawyer managed to pull that off with, with this guy, but I also think that Sawyer didn't really know what he was going to do until he did it. I mean, No, when I he, agree. When he's leaving the house, he acknowledges to Juliet. She asks him, do you know what you're doing? And basically he says, no, nah, but I'm going to, you know, I'm going to wing it and figure it out. Right, this is my thing. Right, it is his thing. And he, he repeats that several times this episode. He lies for a living. He's a con man. And, and boy, boy, does he. But when he... When he finally gets out there with Richard, he doesn't immediately, you know, start with that stuff. He kind of levels with him first. You know, I, I killed your people. You know, this is on me. Your truth, mm-hmm. truth isn't broken. Um, and it's really finally when, when Richard asks, if you're not a member of the Dharma Initiative, then what are you? That Sawyer at that point kind of looks and nods and thinks. And then he sits down and finally says, did you bury the bomb? Like, I really don't think until that moment he knew if he was going to tell the truth or not or to go with another lie. And it's... And knowing that it's the lying and the con artistry that's gotten him this far, it's such a bold choice to go with the truth. Um, And the fact that it works so well, I love it so much. I'm I'm with you. And by the way, stick around for Mark Goldman because we're going to talk about that scene with him and and how he directed that scene and some of the choices he made with the camera there. And it's it's good stuff. What's your hot take, Sammy? So my hot take is about the Dharma people. And basically, I just... I just really don't think this episode paints like the individuals who work for Dharma in a very flattering light. Um, no, like we I get agree. A couple, a couple of examples of that that stood out to me. Um, one is where Amy, you know, is you know tries to trick them into walking through the you know the sonar fence and succeeds. Like even in her grief, and even after they've just saved her life. Like, she is still calculating and, you know, manipulating here. Like, she tries to trick them. It doesn't work. So she double tricks them, basically, and gets them to cross the fence and knock themselves out. So I just thought she seemed pretty, you know, pretty devious and and sly there. Um, Then we also get when Horace is talking to her later and, you know, talking about how they need to turn Paul's body over to the others. And Horace says... You know, we've been friends for such a long time, so this is completely your choice. If we don't want to give him to, if you don't want us to give him to them, then we will suffer the consequences. And it's like, dude, that's not a choice. Like, that's manipulative as fuck. It's like, what kind of choice does she have there? We're going to suffer the consequences if you don't want to do this. So I didn't like Horace in that moment, in addition to him, you know, how he reacted to finding Paul's necklace in in Mm -hmm. the the drawer, just kind of a a dick move. Um, The other one was, of course, Phil. And the introduction to Phil, who's a hilarious character, but I mean, he's going in there and yelling, "You're having a hoot nanny in here," and they're just having to you know, trying to have a good time. It's like, wow, this guy's a jerk. Um, so, just lots of unflattering portraits of Dharma people this week. Yeah, it's definitely not a utopia. Far from it. Um, and we're going to have uh, Patrick Fishler, who plays Phil, on in a couple of weeks. I don't think we've announced that yet, so stay tuned for uh, for, for Patrick Fishler. The one other one, and and this I think leads into one of the hot takes we got from our listeners. Um, the whole plot of this episode banks around, uh, you know, that Amy is, has to deliver this, this baby on the island and Juliet has to save her. She's apparently two weeks 
from giving birth and they're totally dependent on getting people off the island to deliver children in case there's any complications. And she's two weeks from her due date and she's still multiple days, it sounds like, from getting on the sub to go off the island. Like, how irresponsible is that? Like, what are they thinking if they can't deal with anything complicated on the island and she's only two weeks from her due date? What is she still doing there? Like, I just find that to be horribly irresponsible of the Dharma people. I mean, she would have died if Juliet hadn't been there. I mean, yeah. I don't, I'm not an expert on, on, you know, pregnancy and birth, but I know that it's not that uncommon to be two weeks early. Yeah. Huh, that's a good point. That one kind of, I missed that one. Yeah, I just, to me, it was just, you know, again, one of several things that were not, not super flattering about the Dharma yeah. people. <laughs> um, but we got a listener hot take on the, the topic of uh, Juliet's role in, in the birth from, uh, from Colin, so we should play that. Hi, guys. Uh, this is Colin. Big fan of the podcast, and I especially enjoy season five. Uh, my hot take for the episode Le Fleur is that Juliet has seemingly been working in the Dharma motor pool for the past three years, and yet all of a sudden when Horace's wife has to deliver her baby, she gets called into action, bosses around their attending doctor, and subsequently saves the day. I feel like if I was that doctor, I would have been like, why is this bus mechanic telling me what to do? This seems kind of suspect. Yeah, Colin, I, I I agree with this, and I think the show really plays it up when Juliet steps into what will become, like, the delivery room and immediately snaps into this, like, physician persona where she's saying, you know, I need this specific scalpel and I need you to do this and this and this and this. It's like she never left. I will say, for what it's worth, it does seem like Dharma attracts a lot of people with, like, weird pasts. Um yeah, so maybe call. it's not the most surprising wor- thing in the world that this person who maybe was once a doctor or a nurse or had medical training decided to sort of drop everything and come live in what she thought was a utopian society and be a bus mechanic. Um, maybe that's something people did. Yeah, I mean, and I, I, I my, my, my assumption here would just be that at some point Sawyer or Juliet, you know, had told people that she used to be a doctor and, and had given that up. So that, that would be my guess in terms of the, you know, just the continuity of the plot. Um, we've got another one from Rachel here. Hey, it's Reverend Rachel, and I'm really resisting throwing my two cents in at every turn. So I'm, I'm just trying to limit what I say, but I just have to talk about La Fleur because I love watching Sawyer coming into his own, um, the transformation from season one Sawyer to season five La Fleur is this magnificent depth of character where he he finds a place for himself where he fits. He fits in in 1970s Dharma with Juliet and insecurity and with um, with Miles. And um, and I love the moment when he takes that authority to go say, I'm going to talk to Richard. Let me talk to Richard. And he walks outside and has this conversation with Richard that is unmistakably clear. Richard has to understand, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about such confidence and the and but not the cockiness of before the cockiness has transformed to confidence yeah rachel you know i i think i couldn't agree more um you know from cocky to confidence i think is a, a really accurate description and um you know I, I think for me what what really sells it is just i mean josh holloway just needs to basically become a different person like you know sort of out of nowhere in this episode and um, you know, just like Terry O'Quinn this year, kind of playing a, you know, a different version of the same entity, uh, just, just totally kills it and, and sells that this is a, you know, this is a, this is a new man. It's, it, it's really impressive. Yeah. And I, I don't want to jump the gun here cause I want to bring this up later in the episode, but I think the difference there is that this ability was always inside Sawyer, you know, to be a good guy and a, a good participant in society. And yeah, he's got his little scheme on the side where he's having Jin search the grounds, but I think he was always able to do this. He just didn't, circumstances didn't allow for it. And he didn't allow himself to believe that he was capable of it. Um, until all of a sudden he was stuck in a very specific place with a very specific person. And it was kind of like, you know, might as well, but I don't want to jump no. the gun too much. No, I mean, we let's, gotta... anyway, let's get into it. I mean, why not? I mean, we're here. It's like, you know, he, he he's for, you're right, he's forced into that leadership role. I mean, Jack is gone, Locke mm-hmm. is gone. And you sort of see in this episode, I mean, Miles is cracking jokes like, oh, you know, we're, we're probably fucked. He's out there explaining time travel. And, oh, you never have better ideas than just go back to the beach or go back to the orchid. And, 
Um, but despite right. that, there's kind of this assumption that Sawyer's in charge. Like nobody's really questioning. Like Juliet backs him up. Miles grudgingly goes along with the plan, but it's just that they look immediately to Sawyer for leadership and nobody's, you know, Miles might not love all of his decisions, but there's not really a question that he's got to follow his decision. So I just, something is emanating from him at this point now that he's the guy um, that, that, you know, people are turning to him and he's ready for it. And, and I mean, you mentioned the, the description of the Richard scene. I mean, I think that, I mean, that's a sign that he is ready for it. I mean, this isn't three years later. This is in the present that he's doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, So definitely he has a lot to evolve over three years, but some aspect of that, you're right, was was definitely always in him and he's developed it enough in the last, you know, four months on this island that he's ready to start taking on that mantle, I think. Yeah, and that leads us really well into these thoughts from Audrey. Hi, Sunny and Rosie, it's Audrey from Canada. So I guess I'm I'm also in the Maple Syrup Station. Uh, My really, really, really hot take for this episode was, I just wanted to let you notice that um, Sawyer was in his room with Juliet and that's pretty much it. (laughs) Oh, but seriously, it's such a good episode. And to see Sawyer come into his own and take charge, take responsibility, I think he's a really good leader. And it's a shame that um, with Jack and the struggle with Locke and everything, he never got the chance to really show his leadership with uh, with the other castaways. So, yeah, I thought it was really a solid episode. And um, it makes me wish we saw, you know, the whole three years uh, with Juliet and Miles and uh, Daniel. So he has to share a really, really good episode. But also, sorry, it's a little soon. All right, so keep up the good work and I'll see you around. Namaste. I like the comment from Audrey that it would have been cool to see the whole three years. Like, I was thinking that as well. Like, you know, I, obviously it works dramatically for the show to, to skip ahead and to, you know, give these give us these surprises. But I'd love to be able to go back and watch some of those stories of how they integrated themselves into the Dharma Initiative in the way they did. Another spin off idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've got one more uh, listener hot take here from uh, from Ian, and I think this is a, a super interesting one. Hey, guys, this is Ian calling from North Reading, Massachusetts. Uh, I'm a big fan of the show, and I'm really glad to have you guys back for this season. My hot take is about Lafleur, and as much as I want to believe Sawyer's speech to Horace at the end, I think it's all pretty much a lie, and maybe even not a lie that Sawyer recognizes, but so we're experienced with Sawyer being able to tell people exactly what they want to hear, and that's exactly what Horace wanted to hear at that moment, that um, Sawyer himself had gotten over a woman. But I think the evidence is pretty clear that's not the case. We just saw Sawyer that day out with uh, telling Jen that he has to start the grid search all over again. That doesn't sound like a guy <clears throat> excuse me, who's completely over something. Um, I think Sawyer, the, the difference here – between a typical con job and here is that Sawyer wants to believe his story as much as he wants Horace to believe it. Sawyer's just wanted nothing more in life than a simple kind of domestic tranquility. He loved Little House on the Prairie as a kid. He wanted to play house with Cassidy. He wanted to play house with Kate and Dharmaville in season four. And now that he's got a chance for that, he's just not going to accept the fact that there's something that's still haunting him from his past. Um, so he's sort of conning himself when he tells that story to Horace, in my opinion. And it's really sad at the end to he- see the look in his eyes. And you get the impression that he's trying to believe his story, but doesn't quite believe it. Uh, regardless, in the end, Juliet sees through the story. And that's kind of a tragic end to the season. So I, I think that speech to Horace is kind of one of the saddest understated moments in the whole show where Sawyer just so badly wants to believe his story, but it's just not true. Anyway, that's my hot take, and I really love your show. Bye. I think this cuts to the the biggest question that I had about the episode is, is Sawyer really over Kate? And, you know, is he really happy where he's at? And, I mean, Ian brings up a bunch of, you know, interesting... um, you know, bits of evidence uh, for the idea that he's he's not. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's I think it's up for debate though, and I I, I don't know what, what what do you think, Rosie? Where do you stand on this one? So I I think in this conversation with Horace Sawyer does believe what he's saying. I think when he says I can hardly remember what she looks like, he's sincere. Um, I think at this point, you know, I know I know Ian mentions here that he's having Jin go out and search. Still, but I don't think he's looking for Kate. I think he's looking for John Locke. Um, right, although Locke was supposed to be bringing back Jack and Kate, etc. Yeah, but I think Sawyer's kind of. 
he seems shocked, in my opinion, to see Kate. Um, I don't know that he really believes that she's coming back. I'm sure he's thought of the possibility, but I don't think that's the goal here. Um, and I think he is probably genuinely happy with Juliet, like maybe happier than he's ever been because he's, they have this sort of stable, I don't think he's playing house so much as he's actually like living house. I mean, they have this stable life. Apparently a submarine leaves every two weeks and they've decided each two weeks not to take it because they're happier here. And, you know, I think what Sawyer says to Juliet on the dock when he initially convinces her to stay still kind of rings true is like, there's nothing out there. It's 1974, later 1977. Like, what would the point be in leaving? You know, we've got kind of a good thing going here. Let's make the most of it. And I mean, I, I want to agree with you. And I think I do agree with you for the most part, but I, I've still got some questions. I mean, if he really is, you know, happy and content here and doesn't have any serious interest in leaving the island or finding Kate, why is he having Jin still out there methodically searching every quadrant of the island? I mean, what he says to Jin is, I mean, they have this conversation in this episode in, in 1977 where Jin asks, how long are we going to keep doing this? And Sawyer says, as long as it takes. And he refers to it as our people. He says they're looking for our people as if there's, you know, at least a part of him in my, in my reading of that scene that, that still can't quite let go of this idea that, you know, this is this is temporary and something that they've got to, you know, bust their way out of. So what I think is going on there is that Sawyer sort of had a, a John Locke-inspired conversion experience of his own. Um, you know, this episode begins with the moments after the well caves in and John successfully moves the frozen donkey wheel and sets it right and they stop flashing through time. And Sawyer says at that moment that... Now we wait for him to come back. For how long? As long as it takes. You know, I think Sawyer was often, throughout the series, we've seen him kind of drawn to Locke and his vision, sometimes in opposition to Jack, but sometimes because he seems genuinely compelled. Um, because he sort of, I think, somewhere deep down or whatever, believes in Locke's understanding of what the island is and what it can do and has always sort of allied himself with Locke. And I think... When he sees Locke make this sacrifice, I mean, he at one point tries to like jump into the well and go down after him. True. Um, True. I think he's really, really moved or shaken or something by Locke's decision and, you know, wants to do what he can to, I don't know if help is the right word, but I think when he's looking for our people, he's he's sort of thinking like, okay, yeah, we were stranded here. Locke said he was coming back and I believe him. And the way that I can, what I can do about that, you know, I wasn't able to save him. I, I wasn't able to go to back down into the well and see if he was okay or whatever. But what I can do is continue searching and make sure that we, when he does come back with whoever he comes back with, we find them and we do whatever it is we're going to do next. Okay, so you, you really feel that he's doing this out of this obligation to John Locke, that he feels like he has this responsibility to keep this up because Locke did, tried to do this for them and because he said he was going to and he doesn't want to let Locke down or he feels like, you know, he has to fulfill this. I think, I mean, I think if it were just about Kate, he wouldn't be sending Jin to do it. Hmm, that's interesting. You know, I don't really know why I feel that way, but sending Jin to do it makes it seem much more like a communal effort. And, you know, what does Jin care about Sawyer's unresolved feelings for Kate? You know, I mean, they're right. I'm sure he cares a little bit, but like, I mean, I think <sighs> Jin is probably out there like secretly hoping that maybe Sun will come back, even though he made Locke promise not to do that. I mean, I think that's probably where Jin is at. I mean, one, one he, explanation I was thinking of is maybe Sawyer feels like he has an obligation to do this for Jin. Um, I'm not sure there's really any evidence for that in the episode, but it was idle speculation that was on my mm. mind watching them talk about it. I mean, I think it's possible that he feels all three kinds of obligation, right? Like he feels a sense of duty to John. 
Mm. and he is sort of nursing some sort of hope for or or just curiosity or something that Kate will come back and he wants this resolution for Jin and he wants Juliet to finally be able to get off the damn island like I think it can be all those yeah. things at once the, the the other part that threw me a little bit and and maybe you'll have a, a good explanation for this like you did for that one but in the that last you know s- sequence where Sawyer's you know in bed with Juliet and he gets the phone call and he picks it up and he's like oh my god oh shit you know you know Jin Jin has clearly called him and told him who's here mm-hmm. as he's rushing out Juliet asks him what's going on and he won't tell her um, I think I mean to me the most straightforward interpretation of that scene is that he he feels uncomfortable telling her that he's running out in a hurry and is all worked up because he's just been told that Kate is back. Um, I just don't know why he wouldn't just tell her. Well, they're they're back. I can't believe it. I'm gonna go. I gotta go get them. Why why mm. keep it from her? That's a good point. I don't have a great counter argument to that. I mean, I guess what if it had just been Hurley and Jack? Do you think he would have reacted any differently? Because I kind of don't. I think he would have still said, "What? Like, how in the hell is Hurley back? Like, I'll be there in five <laughs> minutes." You know. I think he would have reacted like that, but I also don't see why he wouldn't have told Juliet on the spot when she asked him what's going on. I, and again, I don't I don't like this reading. I don't want to interpret it yeah. this way. I want to have believed Sawyer's speech to Horace, but it does seem to me like the implication there is there's at least part of Sawyer when, even if he believed every word he said, that he even if he really can't remember her face at this point, to, to now be told that she is back gets his heart racing again and, and makes him feel uncomfortable um, you know, sharing that yeah. with Juliet. Well, and I think both of those things can be true. I mean, I think it could have been true that the previous night he said to Horace, But now I can barely remember what she looks like. And her face is... She's just gone. And she ain't never coming back. So... It's three years long enough to get over someone... Absolutely. And then when you hear, oh, by the way, this person is here and she's a mile yeah. away and you have to go pick her up, that your reaction changes. I mean, that seems yeah, very I, human to me. I, I think that's right, too. And I I mean, I think Ian has a fascinating take on, on this. And I, I think I ultimately disagree with his take that this is, you know, a tragic speech and that really Sawyer is bullshitting to himself. I think he does believe it. But I guess I also... I guess I also came away from this episode thinking that Sawyer probably doesn't quite realize how good he has it. Like, he's happy, mm. and he's content, and he seems content. But if he really knew how, you know, how good they had it, would he would he be keeping up this search in the same way that he was? Um, I mean, what I what I thought of was the scene in the finale where, where, Sawyer, where he's, like, beating Jack to a pulp, um, you know, in the incident, mm-hmm. and... And what he's yelling at him at that point is, you think you can come here and do whatever the hell you want? I had a life here. As if, you know, how dare you come back and fuck this up for me? Whereas where we're at now, eight episodes earlier, Sawyer is out there, you know, having Jin hunt every section of the island patrol so when they come back that they can find them, seemingly something he wants to happen. And in the finale, he's, you know, punching Jack in the face. How dare you come here and fuck up the good life I had? So I, I kind of... I guess what I kind of think at the end of the day is that until Kate came back and and sort of fucked things up with him and Juliet, that Sawyer didn't realize, even if he said it to himself and even if he believed it, that maybe deep down he didn't quite understand how good he had it and how badly he didn't want to lose this and that he didn't need what he had before. Hmm. Yeah. Does that make sense psychologically? I'm not, I mean, I'm not a psychologist, but yeah, I I think it does. I mean, I think... Like like you said, I think Sawyer was being honest when he said, like, to Horace, yeah, I'm over, Kate. But has he ever really sat down and thought about Kate? Like, has he worked through mm. any of that stuff? Can yeah. you get over someone simply by them being absent? Or do you actually have to, you know, kind of reckon with it? And I don't think Sawyer has ever reckoned with because he, he his relationship with Kate was so like fraught and weird, and so much of what was between them was never like said, and you know it was all right. And it ended on the moment of him jumping out of a helicopter to save right, her and get right. her off the island with this great personal sacrifice. <laughs> yeah, 
Um, so I don't, I don't really know how you get over something like that. Like when you can't, cause you can never get closure, right? He can never ask yeah. Kate, Hey, what was that? You know, what, was there something, but what did you feel for me? You know, could there have been something there? I'm sure there's a part of him that always wondered, you know, if things had been different, if I had gotten off the island, you know, what might have happened if Kate had stayed, what might have happened? Like circumstances left me here and I made the best of them. But I think I think closure and what Sawyer's describing to Horace, like getting over, I think what he's describing to Horace is forgetting. And that's not the same thing. Yeah, I, I, I like that interpretation a lot. I think you're right to say that he hasn't actually done the work of reckoning with, with what happened in the past because it's not really possible for him to have done so. You're right, he probably right. didn't. When he makes that speech to Horace and the idea that he, oh, I can't remember her face. Can you get over someone in three years? Like, he he believes it, but I think he's also coming up with that on the spot. That's not something that he's previously worked through right. in his head in a really significant way. Like, this is occurring to him now. Like, gee, now that you mention it, can you get over someone in three years? Like, yeah, yeah I guess I, I did that I haven't thought about Kate well. in a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, f- yeah, that, and frankly, it makes me mad, and I... Hmm. not mad at Sawyer, but mad at the show and mad at, mad at Kate in a weird way. Like, even though it's not her fault, it's like, they've got such a good thing. I mean, he, he's got such a good thing here and they just got to come back and fuck it up. Like I identify with Sawyer in the finale when he's, you know, punching Jack in the face. Like he, you know, he has to spend the next eight episodes reckoning with it to get to that point. But, but we're here now because we know what's going to come and we know that Sawyer and Juliet are, you know, really what's meant to be. And it's like, come on, really, you guys? Like, I'm watching the end of this episode. He takes off his glasses looking at Kate. It's like, come on, why? Why? You just let him, just let him. We, we always come back to just let him be happy. Like, they're good now. They're good. <laughs> the only really positive thing that I can say, I mean, not the only positive thing, but one positive thing for Juliet is that I do really like um, that before things go to shit here, that she's kind of finally able to, you know, get over this this issue with, you know, every time she tries to help a woman on the island, they die. Like, she is finally yeah. able to deliver a baby and to do, you know, and to have it not get fucked up by the island. Like it is nice to see her finally have that triumph when that's something that has dogged her for so long. And I I like that Sawyer is able to convince her to give it a shot and she's able to have that moment. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, This episode is so great. I mean, we, we are blessed. We did three, one, six and then Jeremy Bentham and then this, and this might be the best one of them all. It's, um, I can't believe how much happens in 40 minutes in this episode. So much happens and none of it is upsetting. <laughs> a lot happens in Jeremy Bentham, but it's all a bummer. Um, but this episode, I mean, it's fun. We get to meet new characters like Phil and Horace who are just kind of quirky. And we get, Sawyer is always a fun character to watch, but we get to see Sawyer kind of at his con artist best and at his like, you know, goofy wearing reading glasses best. And... Yeah, you know, the great glasses. twists and turns. It's really well constructed. By Tons the way, Horace, Horace, technically a recurring character after having appeared in uh, The Man Behind the Curtain back in season oh, yeah. three. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get too far into gushing about this episode, let's go ahead and throw it to Mark Goldman. Mark directed this episode, and he and Sammy in this conversation gush about all the things that I'm sure we were just about to get into, so we'll let them do it. I am here with Mark Goldman. He directed the episode Le Fleur, although you'll remember we had him on the podcast uh, back in season two talking about his editing work on the show. Uh, Mark, thank you very much for being back with us on The Hatch. Thank you. It's been a long time. Uh, I, hope, uh, I, I hope the one we did last time was a big hit. I can't remember anything we talked about, but I'm sure it was entertaining and fun and, and people just replay it over and over again. You know, you, you guys, you heard it from Mark. You should be replaying those episodes over and over again. Um, that, that's a, that's that's the way to do it. Uh, no, it was it was it was great to have you on last time. It, look, you're the only editor we've had on the podcast, and it's just such a it's a, such a unique perspective, and not one that I think most people normally get when they're you know consuming media about television. So I, I enjoyed it for that reason. Great, great. I'm so, honored. So how did you um, end up directing Le Fleur? If, if I if I I think I'm getting this right, I think it's the first and probably the only episode of Lost that you directed. Yeah, the, yeah, that was the one. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, it was it was something I had hoped to do at some point, and um, we we were in season four, uh, about halfway through season four, and we had been working on a, 
episode you may remember called The Constant. Of course, which, which you edited. Out, which turned out not bad, if I do say so myself. And um, we were all very, very excited about it and very pleased. And so so after that was done, I, I simply asked the guys um, for a shot. Uh, I said... For the, for the following season. I said, I know there are lots of people that would like to direct an episode of Lost, um, but if there's a slot next uh, next year where, you know, I could have a shot, uh, you know, I would really appreciate it. And th- they were extremely kind enough when the time came to say, yeah, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll give you, uh, which episode was it? Was it the, no, 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 no. Oh, no, no. I mean, which was, was it eight? eight? Yeah. The eighth episode? Um and uh, uh, so it's Damien, really Damien, quite simple. Damon and Damien, Carlton. Damon and Carlton. Yeah. I mean, I, it was the easiest way. I simply asked them and they felt like I had, um, after four years there, I had, uh, you know, th- they felt comfortable giving me the shot. Um, so it was, it, it, look, it, it was a, a matter of right place, right time, and me being... Um, uh, proactive and asking for it um do you remember how you reacted when you first saw the script well the first thing i was excited by was that i was going to get to handle um juliet and sawyer Mm. uh two people who they had just the natural chemistry um and i don't know why but i remember in the episode where uh they thought they were going to escape on the freighter and the freighter, the freighter blows up and Sawyer has just swum back to the beach and he's sitting on the beach next to her. And he kind of goes, you know, he sees it and he's like, is that our ship? And, um, and, and I don't even remember. How I think her response it. was, it was, it was, yes, exactly. Yeah. And he sort of plops down and it's like a nothing moment. And yet somehow the two of them, had this chemistry even in that two line scene. So I was very excited to, I I thought it was really cool. The idea of these two people getting together to two individuals that you might not initially think on paper would be a team. And, and yet they, and yet it worked so well. And the fact that my episode would get to explore that, was was really uh, I, I, it was really exciting about that um, the 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 nature of it, it, you know we sort of had a flashback or do we have a flash forward it's a little hard to say because it, you know both times are sort of of the present both the, the uh, what is it nineteen seventy four and nineteen seventy seven yeah <laughs> um, it was definitely. Uh, it was a it was a complex script. It was a complex structure, you know, moving back and forth. But that was kind of exciting for me again, because you have the contrast between your the it, well. It's like all the episodes of Lost, um, in which you have this contrast between what we considered current day and the flashback to the previous time. And here it was just a little more subtle. Um, because it's uh, it, it's contrast between two eras that are only three years apart. Yeah, and also I think the way the you know quote unquote flashback just so directly explains what's happening three years later, and you just you know you're kind of waiting and waiting to understand with the seventy four stuff what's going on in seventy seven. It it just I don't know it, they play off of each other super differently than most lost lost flashbacks do, where it's more conceptual in connection. A- absolutely, absolutely. Um, it's, listen, it, it's even, <laughs> it's, it's confusing for, uh, e- even for the, 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 uh, y- you know, the, the, the actors, um, trying to kind of wrap their brains around mm. how the two interact, interact. And, and I, I, I thought that was exciting. I, I thought there would, I felt like there would be a real energy coming from that, that constantly, that shift between, Sawyer and Juliet, when they're just sort of teaming up out of necessity uh, at the be you know in in seventy four, 
and them in a deep, comfortable, real, uh, loving relationship um, three years later. And we're missing, we're, we're skipping over the evolution uh, of those three years, you know, but, um, but again, uh, that I, I think that's cool. Uh, yeah. You now, know, and unusual. I, I agree completely. I mean, to me, it's one of the shows, you know, you know, sort of low key standout episodes. Um, and, and I want to talk about, you know, several of the points you just made and get into why that is. But, you know, on, on the question of the passage of time, um, I mean, what I was thinking when I was rewatching, it was just like the first, you know, four seasons of this show basically take place over like not even four months. And all of the, you know, relationships that form between these characters are so ephemeral compared to what happens within the space of, you know, 40 minutes in this episode where, you know, when you get to Sawyer and Juliet at the end, like you said, this has been going on for three years that they've been building this. And it just it has such a I don't know exactly how you did that, but it feels I mean, it really feels real. It feels like, oh, this is something different than what we've seen before on the show. I had the same uh, reaction when I was rewatching it. Um as you did, and <laughs> in 1974, uh, you know, Sawyer's only been at this for a little while. I don't, you know, you say a few months. Um, I can't remember exactly how long. I think, I think it was like 110 days when they got off the uh, island or something like that. Okay. So, um, and then, yeah, and and yes, as I was watching it this last time, I thought to myself, he and Juliet have been together for three years, which is relatively an eternity. And certainly for a guy like Sawyer, who has spent his adult life traveling around, you know, uh, trying to get by and, and uh, get away with stuff. Um, this was, it's, it's absolutely appropriate that he ends up with her um, at, in the Bardo at the end of the series. You know, I mean, that is, that is his true love and and it wasn't a flash in the pan thing it it was a it, there there was any an evolution over those 3 years um the scene you, you know there's a part of me that hoped at least some people would be surprised uh, by the time that we get to the scene where he brings her the flower and walks over and kisses her um my guess is most people sensed it coming and were not surprised to see the two of them getting together. I think I was surprised uh, the first time I watched it. I mean, I was a teenager, you? so maybe Way to I didn't go. know any better, but I, I was surprised, yeah. Uh, you were young and so you got foolish. You got me. Yeah. Um, that's great. Uh, and again, it, it, it's like that throwing that, that unexpected um, uh, curveball at the audience is, is a lot of fun. Um, but- well, let me let me ask you this: Talk, what what was it like working with Josh Holloway on this stuff? Because um, and okay, just like because so- he had to be a different person. I mean, he had to be a really transformed person, different. Th- I'm just curious what that was like. Here's here's the best thing. Here's the luckiest thing I had about this episode, and that is that it was it it starred Josh and Elizabeth. Um, that it was it, it, they were the heart of it. It was almost like um, Damon and Carlton gave me a present, by <laughs> like, say, because with those with with those guys, uh, they're solid, man. They are solid actors, and they are really comfortable in their in their job, and they are lovely. Now, I mean, everybody I, I dealt with in the cast was lovely. Um, uh, but th- th- they were the ones that had to carry the story. Uh, you meet Josh Holloway. He's this incredibly n- nice guy. He, and by the way, I don't know if you've noticed, really good looking. Um, Indeed. You know, you're, you're like shaking hands with him and it's like, hey, good to meet you, Josh. And, you know, in your mind, you're going, this really is a very good looking man right here. I got to say. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, and, you know, he's just, relaxed and and uh he's a a hail fellow well met he, he's he's a really good guy and um and he and elizabeth they both have a really good sense of humor um so they were they were they were they were fun to banter with 
Um, and um, the first day uh, on the set, the first scene we directed, uh, we directed, we shot, um, the first thing that I directed was when they have awakened from the, from the flashes uh, in 1974. Um, it's sort of the second scene of the episode. It's, it's after they came out of the flash and uh, the rope was stuck in the ground. Right. Um, and it's, and, and, and uh, Sawyer, you know, they come out of the next flash and Sawyer kind of realizes the well is back and he goes and he jumps and he jumps in. Right. And, and it's, when just, it's filled in and it's dirt and he's just standing there. Exactly. So that was the first scene that I directed. Uh, I was unbelievably nervous. Um, I, and also in a bit of a state of disbelief. The first time you're on a set and you're directing, there's a little bit of, is this really happening? Is this, and uh, I was very nervous and we just, we were just doing a, a rehearsal. Uh, we didn't even know where the cameras would go yet. It's just like, well, let's put the actors out there and let's see what they do with it, you know? And, um, and I <laughs> very nervously called action and was sort of like, who said that? And, um, you, you know, they started that scene and Josh Holloway, like, realizes um, uh, the, the well's back. And this guy, and we haven't done anything yet. I mean, he just runs and he jumps and hops into the well. And I was a little startled. They, they were on right away. Mm. And um, the, um, the amount of preparation that all these actors do ahead of time before they're there on the set is is huge. It's not like you just you know, well, let me read my lines and memorize them. And, you know, he had, he had a sense of what the action should be. Um, and then, you know, you, you, you make changes, you, you talk about how we should do things differently, but the two of them just brought their A game. And, um, uh, and, and yeah, it was, it was nice. What was fun about the scene where um, in 77, when uh, Reiko is in danger of losing the baby and yeah. he runs over. And, that, and... that's uh, Reiko Aylesworth who plays Amy, of course. Yes, yeah. right. I should say Amy was, uh... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, no, Reiko was not in danger of losing the baby, but Amy yes. was. And, um, and he runs over and he tells Juliet, you got it, you got to go. Um, what I love about that scene is there's something that, at least some of the audience, at least Sammy didn't know. And that is that, you know, they were a, a, a bonded couple. Yeah. Um, and it can play as, as either it can play as they're a couple, but it also can play as just, you know, these two, two castaways who have teamed up together to have each other's back. Um, they had a lot of that ready. I mean, they just, it, it, they, I remember after we shot the scene on the dock, um, uh, which I think was the first night. Um, right, the night uh, scene where Sawyer is as asking Juliet to stay and not leave right away on the sub. Exactly. And she, um, and, and it was so beautiful. It was beautifully lit. Um, and, uh, and, you know, Josh, Josh, uh, you know, was working a little bit on, on, how, you know, how he would be talking her into it. And, um, he, I was able to, you know, make a couple suggestions that he really liked, which was a big thrill, by the way. I mean, I remember him looking at me going, I like that. I'm going to use that. And do you, do you remember what you suggested? It, it involved, um, the moment when he says, the funny thing is you won't really notice it in the, in the show. It's, it's the moment where she's like, when he says, the, the, whatever you think you're going back to is not there. And she says, it's not a reason to go back. And he has realized, okay, this is failing. And so he, he says, well, what about me? You're going to leave me here with, uh, Curly, Larry and Mo here. Um, and, and it was just, you know, Sawyer had to, um, had to make a little shift in his strategy. And he was, it, it, it was coming out a little awkward. Um, uh, and I said to him, 
listen, you know, she's looking out to the, um, she's looking out to the water. Why don't, and you're sitting behind her, you're looking at her and she can't see you. So take that moment and think to, and kind of like decide, okay, this is not going to work. I got, I got to try something different and, you know, really plan it. Now in the episode, you don't, you don't see a particularly large beat there. Um, it doesn't need a long beat, but it, 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 it like, it helped him, you know, the next take when he did it, it just, he nailed the line. Interesting. And he's, you know, he said, what about me? And it, you know, it just felt natural. These are the things that it's, it, it, they're like little, little things among the many ways that it's a miracle that any episode of television ever gets made. Um, it's just like little quirks in, in, uh, uh, you know, dialogues or, 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 or words that aren't obvious until you're sort of standing there trying to say them. And then it's, and that's part of the director's job is, is helping figure out those little moments. Mm. Um, he, and, and, and so, so that, and, and that was something, you know, f- you know, side note here for an editor, that's something I didn't have a lot of experience in working uh, in the editing room is, um, you know, I don't work with the actors at all. Uh, I have some sense working in the editing room of, you know, what will be a good shot, what's a good frame, uh, you know, working with the story. But I don't, I don't get the chance to kind of interact with the, with the actors. Um, and so it was very rewarding for me to have that experience doing something that was so different uh for me i was thinking it might have made you crazy directing this episode to not get to edit it to have to hand that off to someone else it's a funny thing it's actually the opposite um i don't have as good as objective an eye on on scenes that i've directed as i do on scenes that i haven't directed Mm. You, you know the 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 way we worked on the set is irrelevant to whether the story works. So I wanted somebody, I, I knew the editor uh, would only, w- would only be focused on whether the story was being told right. or not. What, what I was going to say, I mean, you know, the notes I took on that last, you know, s- scene, the sequence where, where, you know, you reveal that they're together. Mm-hmm. I, I guess what I, what I thought was really impressive about it was just kind of the, you, you do this slow build toward it where it's not just like, bam, right away, like, you know, one second they're not together and the next second you're, you know, revealing it. It's like Sawyer, he picks the flower and he stops and he smells the flower. So you kind of know something's going on and he comes into the house and the camera pans over this table and it's set Mm -hmm. with dinner and, okay, someone made him dinner. And then you see Juliet and it's starting to dawn on you and then they hug and then they kiss and then you get the I love you. Like, I I mean, I imagine you had something to do with that because it's just great how it, I get chills watching that kind of build to the, you know, the real reveal. I was delighted watching that moment again and thinking this does what we wanted it to do. So, uh, you know, the first, uh, you know, the, the first people to deserve the credit for that scene are, uh, the, the writing team that, that came up with the story and, uh, Elizabeth Sarnoff who wrote the script, um, you know, she, uh, she wrote that dialogue to sort of progress in a way that I was able mm. uh, to stage it that way. And, and a- absolutely. I mean, that was the idea of when you're editing, you, you hope that the audience is going, well, what's going to happen next? You, you know, in every moment you want them sort of leaning forward saying, where's this going to go? And, um, this scene, which, you know, which I didn't write, but, you know, and I didn't act it, uh, but which I staged with the help of my camera operators, uh, was an example of, I, I wanted to have that feeling of, you know, he picked a flower. That's interesting. Um, what is, that seems sort of a romantic gesture. Um, 
what does that mean? And yeah, uh, bringing him in, the fact that they're, it, it, it's great because it's, it's, it's real. I didn't have to do anything unreal. You know, she's in the kitchen, he's coming through the door, so they're naturally separate. And yeah, it, it was, it was like, let's have you over here and, um, and, uh, and Juliet will see, see it. And, and I don't remember at this point, whether she acted it in some different ways, but you know, the way she underplayed, um, is that for me? It, It was, it was just right. You know, uh, for sure. It, and, and, you know, we had discussion about, you know, when they come together and th- there certainly is, um, it would have been completely legitimate. I think the first time you see them kiss, if it was a big passionate kiss. Uh, and I just liked the idea of, of, I, I didn't want to completely let the audience off the hook. I wanted like a, a soft, a soft tender kiss because simply because that is in itself unexpected. Um, uh, typically the first time you see a couple kiss on, um, on lost, it's a fairly passionate kiss. God knows the first time we saw, uh, Sawyer and Kate kiss when Sawyer was tied up at that tree being tortured by the others because they thought he had, uh, Shannon's inhaler way back in season one. Uh, that was a, a very, um, hot and heavy kiss. Uh, this was a different. This was a different situation. Right, well, like you were saying, you were trying to show that they were at a place in their relationship where they wouldn't necessarily, need, you know, jump right to the the hot and heavy kiss. It, exactly. Yeah. It was. I, I felt like the. But then you still gave the audience that after the soft, at the end. Yeah. Yes, indeed. I mean, um, and that and that made sense. It's like you, you know, you start out with plans that you're just going to have dinner, and then dinner gets delayed for a little while. Uh, it, it it felt. It, it it felt organic and it, it felt like it, you had more, you had more steps that we could take. I mean, like you said, uh, the coming together, the, the hug. Um, and, and certainly I hope some people, even when they were hugging, were going, wait, what's happening? What's yeah. going on? And yeah. then when they kiss, it's like, hold on. <laughs> right. Um, it, it, uh, it's nice to hear you say that because, that was the intention. I think it was the intention in the writing, and it was it was the intention of um, me and the actors was to show to show the, the 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 strength of the base of the relationship. You know, everybody um, everybody who has a relationship on Lost in, in in on the island, as we've pointed out, they've only known each other a few months. Um, nobody, n- nobody has an established deep relationship because they've just met a few months ago. Uh, and this was a, 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 a this was a different animal. And, and also, you, you know, Juliet ending up in an established relationship, I think doesn't really amaze anyone. Um, but Sawyer, James Sawyer Ford, however, you know, he, that could have been a big surprise. Um, yeah. He, Josh's ability to relax himself, like, you, you, you know, his relaxed nature when he, you, you know, I mean, and look, he played it as he should because he's in good mood. Uh, his friend got saved and they had a baby. And um, uh, it, so it all makes sense. But, the ability to show us that in a way which is not, it's, it's not like, boy, I'm, you know, he doesn't have a line where he says, Oh, I feel so good being in a nice solid relationship. He, he just, he carries himself more relaxed. Mm -hmm. And when he picks that flower and he's feeling good about things and he walks into the house, it's, you know, there's clearly chemistry in the earlier scenes you know, when they have, when they're just sort of establishing a bond um, as allies more than anything. And it's different. You know, they are very, they're even, and I think when you look back at the scene where uh, he goes and to grab Julia to tell her she needs to come save Amy's life, um, 
the, you know, in, when you look at it again, you can see they are very comfortable with each other, even as they're like, they're in conflict. Uh, like every couple has moments of conflict. Like, no, I, I, I don't want to do this. And, and, right. you know, we really need you to do this. Um, and you can see there's all that new history between them there. I mean, it's clear that their relationship has evolved significantly, even if it's not you know, necessarily obvious that they're a couple. And they're looking right at each other and they're very close. You know, they're face to face. So there's a real, there is an intimacy there in the way they are facing each other in, you know, cutting between close ups. Um, you, 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 that's where you get more of a feeling of a connection between the two of them as opposed to, you know, when they're, when, when they're first walking through the woods and he says, thank you for having my back. I mean, they're walking together, but again, they're, they're not, they're kind of like throwing looks at each other. Uh, and, and that's part of the, that's part of what I think sells a, a subtle difference uh, between the way the two interact with each other. So that's the other thing. So we've talked about, you know, Sawyer and Juliet together quite a bit, but I mean, at the beginning of this episode, there's also just the reveal of like, oh shit, you know, they're part of the Dharma initiative and Sawyer is the head of security, which, you know, knowing his outlaw past um, is, is quite a, a twist. So I want, I want to talk about that. Um, how, you know, you filmed those first couple scenes where we find out, okay, we're in the seventies. It's the Dharma initiative. We get the security guys and one of them's dancing with the girl and has pot brownies and everything. And then it, you know, turns on a dime and it's a, you know, it's a security situation. And then you build real fast to the reveal of Sawyer. Could you, could you just talk about filming that sequence and what you were going for there? The, I absolutely um, wanted to, to, <laughs> this was really a case of uh, toying with the audience. Um, uh, uh, you know, I wanted it to be unclear what was going on. Um, you didn't know who they were going to. Um, you, you know, they they were mentioning a name we had never heard. Um, and I, 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 yes, I wanted to save the reveal until Sawyer utters his final line, um, which I re always remember as, oh shit, but I'm pretty sure he didn't say, oh shit. I'm he, he either, I think he, did he say son of a bitch? I can't even remember. Probably. Uh, what it, it's he not coming to my mind right now, but son uh, of a bitch but sounds like Sawyer. It, it does sound like Sawyer. Yeah. Um, and I, I just loved the idea of making the audience go, wait, what's happening? Who, who are they talking to? Um, it was quite deliberate. Certainly, I shot to cover myself. I I, I did shoot um, Sawyer opening the door and looking out, but the intention was to play it the way we did, with just uh, uh, you know on our two jabonis, and then just like slowly pulling back and have him turn and 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 have that moment of what is going on. You know, you got to realize for for editor or us as an editors who aren't part of the writing process. We get to have the fan, the fun that the fan has when we read the script, and mm. there were plenty of times that I would be reading the script and I would go, "Wait, what?" <laughs> um, uh, and and just the idea of finding Sawyer was head of was head of the place was um, was head of security, I should say. Um, it was just too much fun um, it, it, because again. That's one of those moments where, and sometimes in the cutting room, when I was working with Damon and Carlton, there would be a discussion of, are we tipping our hat too much in this? Are we making it too obscure? And uh, if we if we were working on a moment and we got to the point where, um, you, you know, either Damon or Carlton would say, uh, well, I think half the audience is going to know where we're going. And half of the audience is going to be completely clueless. And so that must be about right. Um, and I, I think that's probably a, a, a moment where I'm sure a lot of people, as soon as they hear him saying what um, from inside the house, probably a lot went at Sawyer. Why are they going to talk to Sawyer? Um, and other people perhaps would, wouldn't realize who it was until he turns to camera. That was absolutely a, uh, a, a, an intended delay um, you know, on my part, uh, which 
you know, which they kept. Um, there were actually a couple of other shots, just uh, briefly, that I did want to ask about that were noticeable to me. One was when um, when Sawyer was, you know, busy, you know, telling his, you know, weaving his story to Horace about who they were and what they were doing there. You had um, you had Miles and Juliet and uh, and Dan and Jen sitting outside at like a picnic table in the barracks at night. And the camera was doing this interesting thing where it was kind of circling around them like this noose. My interpretation is it was like a noose tightening around them. I just I was curious about that, if you remember deciding to do it that way. I actually w- was uh, talking with Stephen Williams, who I think directed the second most episodes of Lost after Jack Bender. Yeah, he, he did. Uh, uh, I'm not. I would have been very surprised if it had been otherwise. But um, uh, and uh, and you know, he and I were sort of talking about uh, how to shoot the scene, and we had it was a very busy night. Um, um, and one thing we, uh, I, I, you know, we, we talked about, it, it, there was a practical aspect of that. And that is that, you know, we put the, the, the dolly track around the table. And, it, you know, then we didn't, the, the idea was to try and avoid having to just sh- shoot coverage, meaning start the camera on this side, then you move the camera to the other side and you shoot the uh. other direction. Um, Because you were busy and you were trying to get it all done at once, basically. You know, you you try and get it done at once. And you also, then for the pieces you need, it's just a matter of rolling the dolly um, uh, to to a spot where you need it to to, to get that shot. So the idea started from a a, a pragmatic, how can we we get our our whole night covered in, in the, you know, in... Within twelve hours, and um, what's a faster way than setting the camera up here, then moving all the lights, you, you know, and moving everybody else, uh, and putting it over here, and that is simply let's let's keep a camera in one movable location, you know, one movable track. Well, the track's not movable, but the camera's movable, and uh, and just keep it, you, you know, place it where we need. It gave a sense of. <laughs> It sounds silly to say movement, but, you know, I think sort of the key is when Juliet says, I lived here for three years. I That house over there was mine. And, you know, Juliet is really the most disoriented of all because she's back in this village that she knows well, and it's a completely different place. Um, uh, and... And so for her, it's even more of, <laughs> I know, I know this, this village, and yet I don't know this village. And I think that, that kind of, th- that moving around it, it, it gave a sense, even though the island has stopped, um, these people, they're still in, they're still in flux. Interesting. And I like that. they're still... They're still trying to figure out where where they are, not literally, but you know what's happening and how they're going to handle it. And they what they don't have is Juliet's sense of, huh, I've been here before. Um, this was my home for three years, uh, and I think so. I, I think it's a case of a pragmatic production decision, um, then helping with a. A, a really nice sense of things ha- things being unsettled. Another shot that I really liked, um, which I imagine you may have also filmed that night, although correct me if I'm wrong, was the um, the scene where Richard Alpert, you know, strolls out into the barracks and kind of makes his dramatic entrance. Love that so much. That's uh, one nice thing about being so far away from the episode and not having seen it for a while is I'm I'm sort of able to watch it a, a little less obsessed over uh I should have done this. Uh, I should have done that. Uh, I guess that's okay. Um and uh first of all uh Rich Alpert was a great character. Nestor Carbonell is a great it, 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 you know one of the most subtle actors I've dealt with. He always just had such power even as his in he was like unbelievably quiet. Um, 
and oh, having also one of the most lovely people we've had on the podcast as well. Lovely guy. I didn't have to do any directing with him mm. except, you know, to go, okay, we'll have you sitting on the bench here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, that guy just could yeah. quietly come out and deliver it. Uh, you know, even the way he like, he, come, he slammed the, um, the torch down in the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, somehow he walks out so quietly, confidently and quietly. And, and he like puts that torch down with such authority. Um, I don't know. I don't know how you do that. I don't know how s- some actors just can move in a way that tells so much about their mm-hmm. character and he can do it. Um, I honestly think that may have been a different night. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, 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 I think we had two nights that we shot in the village though. Um, if it was all on that one night, that would explain why I was trying to find ways to, uh, yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but even, you, you know, the, uh, this, the scene, the scene was, uh, great because, um, because it was leading up to that moment of Sawyer saying to him, did you bury that bomb? Uh, yeah, my, my, my heart rate starts to, you know, jump at that moment. It's so good. It's so great because it's like Sawyer is the audience at this point. Uh, Sawyer knows everything that's been going on, just like the audience does, as much as anybody knows what's going on with the island. Um, and he kind of breaks the fourth wall. He, you know, mm. he, he like suddenly he breaks the fourth wall of time. It's like it's 1973 and he blows it open and says, oh, I, you know, yeah, uh, 20 years ago, John Locke came in and uh, and talked to you and I know about the bomb. And, uh, you know, I mean, he could have said I'm from the future. Um, and it, it it's just so unexpected um, for poor Richard Alpert. Um I was just going to say, in terms of your direction, the thing that jumped out at me right away in that scene was you had that great shot where you see him, you see, you see him walking out into the barracks from Sawyer's perspective and Juliet's perspective from a great distance, peering through the mm-hmm. window. And there's that second of like, is that, that? I mean, you're kind of squinting. Like that kind of looks like Richard Alper. Like, oh my! I, I, I just, I, I love that you did that instead of just, you know, like cutting, you know, like a straight up, you know, close up of him walking out into the camp. And that's exactly the the sensation that I, I, I want to try and create. Mm. It's, it's the, it's that moment of wait, who are they? Is that Sawyer that they're talking to? You you know, that, that who is that? Um, You, you want, you, you want, there's two things, you you know, cinema is like music. There's anticipation and there's release. And you want people sort of like, feeling like, oh, what's going to happen? Are we going to go? And then, boom. And then, you know, uh, the music builds and builds and then it releases itself. And and, and it, it worked really well. I was, you, you know, when we, when you realize, oh my God, it is absolutely him. And that's also the moment when Juliet went, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> well, look who it is here in 1973. Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and so you want to have that, it's a suspense beat. If you say who it is right away, yeah. sure. There's the suspense of well, what's going to happen now, but when it's a mysterious figure coming out, it just, it, it drags out that moment. And by the way, it's not just the audience, it's Sawyer and Juliet who, again, just hours after they had finished flopping around in time and they're still trying to get their bearings and um, they don't know what's going to happen next. It, when Sawyer goes out and talks to him, um, you know, first Richard and he are looking at each other and Richard's like, do I know you? Now, in this case, you know, one Richard's sitting, Sawyer's up high. When Sawyer, like, then goes and sits down next to him, Sawyer completely takes control of the situation by doing something actually very um, intimate, it's too strong a word, but relaxed. He's so not afraid right. of Richard Alpert that he's going to go sit down right next to him and kind of, you know, buy him a beer and 
put his uh, put his arm on Richard's right. shoulder. Let me know. tell you how it is, friend. Yeah, right. So did you bury that bomb, by the way? <laughs> the one that you don't know that anybody knows about? Um, and, 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 and that, th- there's a case where the closeness of them, um, it, 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 it sort of has the opposite effect that it does with the closeness of, of Sawyer and Juliet in that, um, it, it illuminate, it, no, it, it highlights the, the different places that the two of them are from. One thing that always cracks me up about these interviews is that people will sort of start by saying, oh, you know, this was 15 years ago. I don't remember the details. And then just remember an astounding amount of detail. I know. It's great. <laughs> it's wonderful. I, I did love, I mean, it's so great to hear that just Josh Holloway and Elizabeth Mitchell were just such wonderful people to work with. Like they seem like they would be that way on screen and you never know with actors. So it's nice to hear that. Um, I loved his description of Nestor Carbonell as one of the most subtle actors that he's ever dealt with. And, you know, particularly his calling out of how Nestor made putting the torch down in the ground just yeah. an act of authority. Like that, after I watched that, having heard him say, oh, fuck, you're right. Like that makes an impression. Yeah, it's scary. Um, Normally I'm not scared of Richard. I'm sort of like, <laughs> you know, lightly unnerved because you know that there's something supernatural about this person. But yeah, I was I was a little scared. Let me ask you this. The uh, d- Do you remember when you first watched this episode, if you saw the twist coming that Sawyer and Juliet were going to be in a romance? Because clearly, as I said to Mark, like, you know, I didn't see it coming, but I wonder if you have any recollection of that. Oh, gosh, I'm pretty sure I did. Um, I don't remember any big moment of shock. And they do, you know, tease it pretty heavily in the episodes leading up to this, I think. Um not tease it so much as like it's very obvious that these two people get along and work together well and by the time you know in this episode and mark talks about this i think in a way that's really useful like there's a lot of moments where before the the official reveal they're like standing very close together um in ways that normal people don't stand right like you don't just stand six inches away from someone at the grocery store or even a colleague, right? Like if you're getting coffee and your colleague comes up, you don't like get face to face and have this really intense moment. I mean, I think it's, there's enough there that you, you can tell what's coming. I don't recall specifically, but I'm pretty sure. I mean, it's still a super satisfying reveal either way. Um, Right. I guess if you see it coming or if you think you see it coming, you probably very badly want to, you know, still see it happen at the end. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, Mark, Mark, I mean, I just, I have to say, I'm, I mean, especially knowing that he's not a full director full time, that what he does is editing, like he did a phenomenal job directing this one. Um, big, big props to Mark Goldman. I agree. We will hear a little bit more from Sammy's conversation with Mark next week. Um, it's still kind of about LaFleur, but some, some broader topics as well. Uh, next week, of course, we're going to be watching Namaste. Yeah, and, uh, you know, like I said earlier, we've got some more great guests coming this year. We've got uh, Patrick Fisher, who plays Phil, coming up in a couple weeks, and uh, more from Damon Lindelof in the finale. Um, Until then, uh, find us on social media. We're on Twitter at The Hatch Podcast, facebook.com slash The Hatch Podcast. If you would like to leave us a hot take about Namaste or any of the other episodes that are coming up, you can do so by calling 9546-DHARMA. Yeah, you can also go on our Facebook and uh, shoot us a, uh, a voice message via, uh, via direct message on Facebook. We also would love it if you would rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or wherever you're listening. Uh, leave us a rating and review. It helps other people find the show. Our theme music is by Andy G. Cohen, and our cover art is by Danny Roth. And we will be back next week. Namaste. Namaste.